Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. Wei Ming plays hopscotch in hopes of landing a dorm site. And let's talk local trash. <laughs> Stay tuned and learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. The China-based education group Wei Ming has apparently chosen not to build a school dormitory on land owned by developer Borton Katzman. The land first considered by the Chinese-based company was located next to M24 in the Oxford High School. That tract was rejected due to soil contamination issues. The second possible site was on Oxford Road, again next to the school. That selection passed the pre-site planning phase required by the Planning Commission with a few ordinance issues to be resolved first. However, Wei Ming then withdrew their plans prior to submitting to the ZBA. Since then, there has only been silence from Wei Ming. Although the architect assigned by the Chinese said that they are no longer interested in the Borton Katzman property, they claim the project is still alive and are still looking for a suitable site. According to township officials, however, only time will tell if Wei Ming will continue to pursue a suitable dorm site. On a successful note, Oxford Township officials gave a hearty nod to property developer Borton Katzman for a proposed 360 apartment site plan cited for the property west of the high school once considered by Wei Ming. The first phase of the construction will consist of 140 apartments and a clubhouse along with 42 townhouses. The remaining development will begin when all infrastructure is completed for the last phase. With a 3-2 to two vote, the Oxford Village Council chose an out-of-state trash hauler for service to village residents for a rarely precedented five years. Council members Brian Cloutier and Rose Bema turned down the motion to approve Republic trash haulers preferring to give the contract to local bidder odd jobs. The locally owned family operated company has earned a reputation for its great personal service. The cost difference would have been roughly $1.60 per household more. Council President Sue Basardit, uh, Maureen Helmuth, and Tom Kennis did not vote in favor of the locally owned family operated business, but instead committed village residents to the Arizona-based company for the next five years. Once again, the Downtown Development Authority has a new director. By unanimous vote, the Oxford Village Council approved Cambridge City, Indiana resident Joe Frost as the new director. Frost comes with a Master's in Historic Preservation from Ball State University and a Bachelor's Degree in Geography from Michigan State University. Go Green! Frost brings his wife and family with him from Indiana. However, he is a Michigan man born and raised in Davison. Welcome, Joe. And the Seymour celebration, including carnival, fireworks, and bandstand music, takes place Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, July 9th through the 11th at Seymour Lake Park in Oxford Township. You can purchase discounted bride armbands and obtain more detailed information about the celebration by going to their website, seymourcelebration.com. A woman jogging on Pollyann Trail complained to police that three male juveniles riding bikes hit her with a can of soda. Although the woman gave a full description of the gaggle, they were not immediately able to locate the pop tossers and this case is still open. A resident living on Oxford Lake Drive in Oxford notified officers that a group of teens were seen entering a wooded area carrying a gun. Village officers found the kids shooting at tin cans with a BB gun. The kids received a lecture on local safety regulations and laws governing pellet and BB guns and were sent on their way. A business owner on Gillespie Street was a victim of malicious mischief this week, peppering his parking lot with tire marks and a window was broken out of his building. The case is still under investigation. Sheriff's deputies suspect it was an inside job when they were informed by a township resident that his credit cards and several checks were missing from his home. The resident informed police that in addition to the missing items, his bank account balance had been tapped as well. Records showed that someone had been using his ATM card and checks 
had been cashed that he did not write. The man approved or provided officers with the possible suspect in the case and the investigation will continue. Well, that's rough when somebody steals your credit cards right out from under you. <laughs> What, your security in your own home or just feeling comfortable in your own home and that also leads into the malicious, malicious mischief that's happening in town and I know this is the time for it kids are out of school and they're celebrating or whatever but to walk down the Pollyann Trail and not feel secure mm -hmm. on the Pollyann Trail is or at least comfortable is disappointing mm -hmm. I'm pretty disappointed to hear that some kids throwing pop bottles and the poor guy with his window broken out in his building on Gillespie. I just, I'm disappointed. I, I think that all starts at home. I think you need to have conversations with your kids that it seems harmless or it seems like that that's all they're doing, but the ramifications mm -hmm. and the domino effect where he's got to call the insurance company and he's and you as a business owner know what that no means to yes. your customers. Uh, in my stores we had at least four break-ins I can think of um, and one theft situation which actually we apprehended the individual in the store for that but um, you know I, I, I think it all has to do I think we have a lot of freedoms here in the US yeah. and we're mm -hmm. going into the 4th of July here of course uh, recognizing those freedoms that were given to us mm -hmm. uh, but you know the freedom ends you know, when at the end of it the does. nose. So, yeah. I mean, when you impact somebody else, it, yeah. you're talking about expenses and... And, and security, uh, just if, feeling secure. If somebody is breaking into your building, they're breaking windows, you gotta repair those. Mm -hmm. And if they steal items, which they, they're there to mm -hmm. do, or money, mm -hmm. uh, that has to be replaced somehow by the business. And everybody thinks, well, the businessman has a lot of mm -hmm. money and he mm -hmm. can do this, but it, and he'll just pass it on, you know, to the consumer. You really can't do that as a business person and, and still remain in business. Right, right. So, you know, it, it's... It just harms everybody, just those it's a small hardship. little pranks or whatever. The poor woman on the Pollyann Trail, mm -hmm. let's see if she walks down that trail again. And I'm a little disappointed also in the village council's decision. Yeah. I know that this is a subject I have beat up and it's my personal opinion, not OCTV's opinion, but I'm very disappointed that they ended up going with an out-of-state company because I don't think in the long run it's gonna save. Mm -hmm. I think um, because of that guy's contract that he's able to increase the cost next year mm -hmm. and he's got a five-year contract he's probably going to continue to increase the cost to where they could possibly pay more than what they're paying now so as you know we we really do believe in keeping our local businesses ah. strong here I'll i mean you. here's a company that's paying taxes and so forth and mm -hmm. and it'll cost a dollar sixty i think more you know per household in mm -hmm. order to keep a local business but it should i think as I mean, a benefit those people pay taxes they mm -hmm. donate you know to oh, the various they, charities so and so forth. The and they've company. been very good, um, you know, uh, residents, you know, to the community. Yeah, they're good neighbors. You know, support. Really good neighbors. Yeah. And they had a lot of support from their customers. So I don't know what the village council was thinking. That should have taken precedent in my mind. And mm -hmm. it's and it, easy for me to play armchair quarterback, but I've been in that position. And to yeah. me, that, that was a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. I just am really... And it actually comes down to the 62 pound container you know for uh, recycling and <laughs> the garbage just uh, the yeah. big garbage thing yeah outside yeah what are you gonna do with an extra can that size i talked it over with my wife this morning she says i don't want one even if it's given to me <laughs> she'd <laughs> she have to move her car out of the garage to fit it back in there it's ridiculous right. and odd jobs even said to council i know they were there and i know they were listening we don't give them out to our customers because they don't want them right so, oh, I'm disappointed, but that's it for They Oxford said, yes, News. they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the council said, oh, sure right. they do. That's it for Extra News this week. If you want to learn more about these stories and others, stop by your local store, and I'll still promote local, and pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper, or better yet, catch us right here at OCTV on Charter Channel 191 or AT&T Channel 99. And coming up next, OCTV, stay tuned for Oxford Local Sports and catch John Ochins. Oxford School News. Also, join Dave Kenny with Auto Talk and Science in the News with Dave Kenny. I'm Terry Stiles, and this is Oxford News This Week, where your news is closer to home. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching.
Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. In our first story, now that's a long space flight. Russian cosmonaut Gennady Fedalka, currently on board the International Space Station, has broken the record for total time in space. Now he's beaten the previous record of 803 days, 9 hours, and 41 minutes. Fedalka is set to return to Earth on September 11th, having amassed 878 days in space in five trips, and hopes to fly again to break the 1,000-day mark. Wow. And still in space, or not quite so much, the explosion of SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket mere minutes after launch was strike one for the U.S. hopes of rebooting crewed spaceflight. This is the very type of rocket the company wants to use to send people into space in 2017. You want a really, really reliable rocket before you put people in it, says Jonathan McDowell of Harvard University. Now that SpaceX has lost its perfect launch record with this rocket, it will need to quickly convince people that the rocket can be trusted, he says. The Falcon 9 was 18 for 18 and looking pretty good. Now it's 18 for 19, and that's a 5% failure rate. But if another 10 launches of the Falcon 9 proceed without incident, that will bring the failure rate to 3.5%, which could be acceptable, he says. Among almost two, two metric tons of supplies and equipment in the Dragon space capsule atop the rocket were two docking stations intended for SpaceX to dock its crew Dragon capsule to its International Space Station. It was also carrying several plants and animal experiments. The failure shouldn't force a delay in plans to launch the first crewed space mission in, on U.S. soil since 2011, says William Gerstenmeier, NASA's Associate Administrator for Human Exploration at a press conference. It could help us to nail down designs and move forward, he said. The Falcon 9 rocket exploded two minutes and 19 seconds after launch from Cape Canaveral in Florida. In a tweet, Elon Musk said it was triggered by too much pressure in a liquid oxygen tank in the upper stage of the rocket, adding, data suggests counterintuitive cause without further explanation. It was in the upper part of the rocket, not in the part that was firing at the time, says McDowell. That's representative of a class of failures associated with structural and aerodynamic problems. McDowell says there are probably no safety procedures that SpaceX would undertake during a crewed flight that could have prevented this explosion. But Crew Dragon would have had an escape system that would save the capsule so he wouldn't have killed the crew. SpaceX has been careful to do the experimental test after the operational part of each mission, he says uh, McDowell. So playing with the new stuff in the stage one re-entry phase shouldn't make an all-important launch uh, phase more dangerous. The explosion also follows a number of failures of other ISS supply rockets. Watching from on board the ISS, U.S. astronaut Scott Kelly summed up the sentiment in a tweet saying, space is hard. You bet. And back on Earth, among primates, humans are the kings of lateral thinking and also of lateral vision. It seems that the shape of our eye sockets means we can view more of our world without moving our head than other great apes. This may have given our ancestors an edge when they descended from the forest into savannas, but whether it drove our evolution or was a consequence of it is unclear. Primates have forward-facing eyes, and humans are no exception. But look closely, says Eric Denian at the French Institute of Health and Medical Research in Cannes, and you'll see that human eyes are different. To work out just how different, Denian's team examined 100 modern human skulls and 120 ape skulls, 30 belonging, each belonging to gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees. They found that the human eye sockets, or orbits, were much wider relative to their height than the other ape eye sockets. What's more, the outer margin, the side of the orbit furthest from the nose, is recessed much further back into the human skull than other ape skulls. That means when we swivel our eyeball sideways, we have a lateral view of the world that is unimpeded by the bones of the skull, unlike other apes. Last year, Denny and his colleagues showed that we can increase our visual field by almost 50% by simply moving our eyes while our head is held still. This suggests that the trait may have been beneficial to early humans. It would have been more energy efficient and quicker to move the eyes rather than the whole head when they wanted to scan the savannah, said Denian. That makes sense, says Robin Dunbar of the University of Oxford. Better all-around vision would certainly be more advantageous for predator detection, he says. Or perhaps they simply emerge as a consequence of other changes in the shape of our head. For example, our chewing muscles are smaller than those of our distant ancestors who had to chew on harder, uncooked food, he says, which has affected the shape of our skull. Our eyes might protrude as an indirect consequence. But Dunbar says our protruding eyes are unlikely to have evolved purely by chance. Given the significance of the difference, 
it must have had fitness consequences, he says. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back. I'm John Ochens, and welcome to the Oxford Wildcats School Update. There's been a lot of talk about the Waiming International Student Dormitory during this school year. Much time has been spent clarifying the school district's position on its operation and role involvement. We talked very little on the progress of the building itself. This week, we dropped by Oxford Township Supervisor Bill Dunn's office. Brian Oppmann, an architect with Carlisle Wortman Associates and our township planner, also happened to be there. We asked him to give us a thumbnail sketch of what's happened so far with the township. It, they've had two different sites go to the Planning Commission. The first one uh, was south of the Myers and Tim Hort basically across the street from Tim Hortons um, on East Market Street and they did get a preliminary approval on that site however there's a lot of variances that they would have to get um, and since that time they essentially withdrew that that approval and that application and applied to a site south of the high school basically south of the football field and that one uh, also received preliminary approval. However, it was four stories. There was a lot of site plan issues that had to be worked out. It was just a preliminary approval. That's not anything set in stone, but it's uh, essentially a framework of approval that uh, you know they would still need variances before any final approval. So they've got to come up with considerable requirements before anything further can be done. Is they, either right? meet, they, they either meet the ordinance or Brian, uh, if they don't, Brian denies it. That automatically kicks it to the, uh, the ZBA. And that's where it was. They were given some conditions that they couldn't meet, so they were supposed to go to the ZBA, and uh, we have not heard from them since. It was about a month ago that the Y Ming organization was told of the requirements. We asked them to clarify what the next step would be. Uh, the preliminary approval that they received uh, earlier this year really was, it, it's a, we have a two-step process through the Planning Commission for approvals of site plans. One is the preliminary and then the second is the final. The final approval is essentially what will be done on the site, what will be built. Uh, and what they would come in and get permits for, they would never get final approval without variances being received from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Okay. Because they, they, there's ordinance issues that they couldn't meet. I know it's, it's hard to talk about stuff like this without the paperwork in front of you, but you, could you just give us a feel for some of the stuff they have to come up with in order to qualify to go on to the next step? It's not a feel, it's a... It's a fact. Yeah. They're, okay, and if you know that, that's fine. Yeah. Well, there's two issues that they they were exceeding the ordinance requirements. One was the number of stories that's allowed. Uh, the number of stories that's permitted is three. They were asking for four, four stories. And then the second is in the multiple family zoning district where, where the second site was located, the maximum uh, length of the building is 200 feet. And that, that's designed in multiple family projects to, to break up the facade, to, to not have one big long building um, built in an apartment setting or a condo setting. So, right. And what was the size of theirs? Uh, about 280 feet or so because yeah. it, it included a cafeteria as part of the wing of, of the dormitory. At the most recent school board meeting, there was much talk of different awards that were earned this school year. One of the groups was our high school first robotics team. One of their mentors went through a laundry list of great accomplishments this year that included third place at Waterford District, second place at Western Michigan District, Dean's List nominee at Bedford District, quarter finalist at the Michigan State Championship, overall third place state ranking, and third place qualifier at the first World Championships in St. Louis. In addition to the awards, there are some great scholarships going out to some of these kids. Great job. That's the Oxford School News Update for this week. Stay tuned for sports and more. This is Oxford Community Television, keeping it local.
back in Oxford News this week. Obviously, when we get closer to Oxford Sports in the fall, we'll probably have more. So, hey, we're reaching for whatever we can. And when it comes to tossing custard pies, Japan is the cream of the crop. The country won the 48th Annual World uh, Custard Pie Throwing Championship this past Saturday. 18 teams involved, 17 of them which are from the United Kingdom, showed up to Cox Heath, UK to battle to, for a chance to be in the upper crest of the pie-eyed sport. This is according to Yahoo News UK. The rules are very simple. Teams of four clad in bizarre costumes stand next to each other and toss pies at the opposing team eight feet away. According to KentOnline.com, a direct hit in the face is worth six. A chest hit earns five. A hit on the arms brings three points, and points are deducted after three missed pies. The Japanese team, which competed under the moniker ITQ, beat the team called the Fairy Cakes to win the top honor. However, team members are, were confident about their chances even before the event began. With a win under its belt, the Japanese team has promised to defend the crown at next year's competition. You know, I think locally we could send Akas over there. They could, you know, the thing is about with their pies, though, they're too darn delicious to throw. Oh, okay, something to think about. An argument over NASCAR and IndyCar has led to a domestic battery of a man in Franklin, Indiana. David Wilson, 57, was arrested on uh, a few Sundays ago. He allegedly choked his fiance during the Indianapolis 500 viewing party that he was attending. The victim told officers that she and a suspect had been drinking all day. Wilson told police he was making dinner in the kitchen when he heard his fiance and another person talking trash about NASCAR in the living room. Wilson allegedly came into the room, started rambling on about NASCAR being better than IndyCar. According to the incident report, he choked her, according to the Indianapolis Star newspaper. Probably didn't get dinner either. Right now, in a segment we would like to call, Can I Talk to Rod? Right. We'll go out and interview some interesting guests. So, I got Abby Franny. Am I pronouncing that? Franny. Franny, okay. And then I got Emma Bunting. I know you very well, don't I? We're having fun this year. You guys can feel too. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been practicing? Yeah. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, you guys are winning all your games this year? Uh, uh, some of them. Some of them? Yeah. Well, you look good out there. You got a good pitcher. Thank you. Isn't your pitcher good? Yeah. yeah. Now, what, what position did you play last inning? Catcher. You, oh, you're the catcher back yeah. there running around? You like it back there? Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. You got to be crazy to be a catcher, girl. <laughs> You're probably a goalie if you played hockey, too, right? I don't know. I don't know. I bet you would. <laughs> so what position you playing? Third. You playing third? Oh, yeah, you put that one out, didn't you? That's a long throw. You know, you can bounce it there. It's okay as long as it gets there. Yeah. That's a long throw, though, isn't it? So we're having fun this year, aren't we? Yeah. Uh-oh, look at see what Julie got on. Oh, Julie just hit one to second base, and they got her out. But she hit the ball, right? Yeah. So, you got, so what's the highlight so far this year? Highlights, best time. Uh, Did you get like a big hit to win the game, walk off? A, yeah. Um, 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 put you on the spot, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, are you girls having fun? Yeah. It's a great season. A few more games this year? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, will you get a hit for me? Yes. Promise? Yes. Okay. Well, have fun, girls. Okay. Thank you. All right. That was Emma Bunting and Abby Franey. I pronounced it right. Yeah. All right. Just a reminder, the programs you see on OCTV can easily be viewed online on your personal device. Go to OCCTV.org, hit Programs tab, or hit the YouTube tab, and you can watch any of our programming on demand, your computer, iPad, or phone, wherever you choose to look, whenever you want. Again, go to OCCTV.org, check that out. Our sporting programs, the ones that we have, and school-related programs, are on Saturday and Sundays between 1 and 6 p.m., again, or at OCCTV.org. Going into summer, and we are into summer, check it out. If you're seeing us out there at any one of the Little League competitions or softball matches, feel free to come on up. Maybe we can get an interview and pass that on here on OCTV. Anyways, that's going to wrap it in sports. Hope you guys have a great week. Enjoy your holiday celebration, and we will see you next week on OCTV. Take care. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, the next generation Chevrolet Cruze will be lighter, larger, and packed with connected car technology and safety features a bid by Chevy to solidify its status as a top small car contender. 
The 2016 Cruze will be 2.7 inches longer but shed about 250 pounds versus its predecessor, helping the car achieve an expected 40 miles per gallon EPA highway fuel economy rating. It's also about an inch lower and sports a more sculpted swept back profile, making it one of General Motors' most aerodynamic cars. The redesign of GM's top-selling global car was at a media event hosted by CEO Mary Barra and Global Product Development Chief Mark Royce, and it's scheduled to go on sale in early 2016. The base engine for the redesigned model will be a new 1.4-liter .4 four-cylinder turbo, the same displacement as the turbo engine available on the current car, but 11% more powerful at 153 horsepower and 20% more torque, 177 pounds-feet. GM says the car will be quicker, going from 0 to 60 in about 8 seconds. A stop-start system will come standard as GM rolls out that fuel-saving technology across more of its lineup, and the recently unveiled 2016 Malibu gets it too. The engine will be connected to a six-speed manual or an available new six-speed automatic transmission. GM is sticking with a diesel model despite modest sales of the two-liter diesel cruise that went on sale in the summer of 2013. The diesel accounts for less than 5% of U.S. sales. The next-generation diesel cruise will arrive sometime in 2017 with a 1.6-liter under the hood built in Hungary. The wheelbase is about an inch longer, creating more rear seat legroom. The current cruise already has the most cargo space among the top five compact sedans at 15 cubic feet. GM says the redesigned version will have even more, but the specification isn't finalized yet. The car comes with 4G LTE high-speed internet connection, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, wireless phone charging, and a new, faster iteration of Chevrolet's MyLink infotainment system. Chevrolet is the only mainstream brand with 4G on most of its vehicles and the only one to offer Android Auto and CarPlay although many are expected to follow. Other interior extras include a heated rear seat and steering wheel and a 4.2-inch high-resolution display in the gauge cluster. The interior trim includes a lot of piano black shiny surfaces and some matte black finishes. Available safety features will include side blind spot alert, forward collision alert, rear cross-traffic alert, and lane-keeping assistance. Do we need more? <laughs> The car's silhouette is sportier with a steeply raked windshield and fast sloping rear that gives way to an integrated rear spoiler which helps aerodynamics. The face is in line with the 16 Malibu and other recent Chevrolet entries, a deeper, wider dual port grille that stretches to the headlights which are swept back into the front fenders. The front end also gets LED daytime running lamp, who doesn't have those now, added for a premium effect. And still at Chevrolet, Chevrolet will offer a convertible version of the redesigned 2016 Camaro with a fully automatic top that can open or close at speeds up to 30 miles per hour. General Motors builds the Camaro's drop top as the most sophisticated top in the segment with latches that automatically release and secure the top. The car was unveiled June 24th by Chevrolet Global Chief Alan Beatty. Layers of acoustic and thermal barriers built into the Camaro's electro-hydraulic roof are aimed at dampening road noise, GM said in a statement. The drop-top Camaro will arrive in early 2016, a few months after the fourth quarter launch of the sixth-generation coupe. The convertible accounts for 40% of all Camaro sales in the U.S., Chevy says. Designers said the top folds completely down beneath the car's belt line and will be covered automatically by a hard tonneau cover. Most convertibles require the tonneau cover to be uh, positioned manually. The redesigned Camaro Coupe is slightly smaller and more than 200 pounds lighter than the car it will replace, which has been on sale since 2009. It will be assembled at a GM plant in Lansing, Michigan. And on the recall front, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles is launching a voluntary recall of about 164,000 Jeep Cherokee SUVs globally to install shields that protect the power liftgate control components from moisture. The liftgate control modules in the 2014 to 2015 Cherokees equipped with power liftgates may be inadvertently exposed to water, which can cause the mechanism to catch fire. FCA in a statement said it began investigating the issue after a vehicle fire was reported directly to the automaker. The automaker is unaware of any injuries or accidents related to the defect, however. Over 99,000 of the affected vehicles are in the U.S., 13,195 in Canada, and over 2,400 in Mexico, and over 48,000 elsewhere. Well, that's all for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back. I'm Oakland County Sheriff Mike Bouchard and former Red Wing great Joey Coaster reminding you to follow the rules regarding boater safety. 
Always operate at safe speeds, avoid alcohol, and wear a life jacket. Don't let a great day on the water be ruined by bad decisions.